Thank you. Well, welcome to the Commonwealth World Affairs San Francisco. This is a very special evening for us because we have with us the ambassador of Cuba on one of her rare trips to California. And so we're honored to have her. And you know, Ambassador, I don't know if you know this, we think of California as the Republic of California. So we, we, we think a little bit differently. So well, I cannot say anything on that. Well, but I'm a diplomat. You know, I had to respect the, the host country, so I won't say anything on that. So maybe we can get things accomplished here in the Republic that the rest of the country can't get done. So maybe with our dialogue tonight, we can... I wish you the best. Okay. That. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know... Cuba is top of mind for a lot of people. You're here in California. What is the particular driving force for this trip? What are you trying to accomplish while you're here in California? Well, I think that as diplomats, we have to uh, try to bring together our countries, the country where you come from and the one that, uh, where you're accredited. And that's the main objective. I'll travel, I travel across the, the U.S., and the main purpose of those travels is to build bridges between Cuba, between our people and the, the U.S. people, and between the states and Cuba. And that is what brings me to uh, California. And what kind of companies and organizations are you meeting with, and why is it important for you, representing Cuba, to be meeting with them? You know... The only way in which you, I think we can advance relations between countries is engaging. And Cuba, we are in San Francisco. And Havana and San Francisco, for example, we have so many similarities, and Cuba with the US, that there's no sense that we don't have a better relation in certain areas of us or as many areas as, as we can. Are there any particular areas that you would like to try to get much closer to for economic reasons in Cuba? Well, food production is a priority for Cuba. It's a, it's a, a pending issue, and anything that could be done in that area is important for us. And this is, it could be important for, for California too, since you are one of the uh, biggest producers in, in the US. So anything in agriculture, in agribusiness, even in research in that area, because we have centers in Cuba that, are, uh, that uh, do research in agriculture, trying to make uh, our crops more resilience to climate change. We, remember, we are an island. And as an island, we are, we are very exposed to climate change and hit by climate change. And try to overcome that or to tackle that is a priority for us. So research in agriculture is a priority too. But Cuba is very well known for the development that we have in biotech. You developed your own vaccines. You've been supplying that was medicines to Latin America for years. Yeah, that was a challenge, Mike, because during COVID, we have to decide with the very few uh, financing money that we have in our hands, do we wait and for the vaccines or do we produce our own vaccines? And we took the second decision. And we begged for that. And we, at the end, in less than one year, on one year, less than one year, we have five vaccine candidates. Three of them, three of them became vaccines, 100% Cubans. And we immunized more than 90% of the population with that. Well, I mean, <coughs> Cuba has a long history of sharing its healthcare services. I can remember the first time I went to Cuba in 92, I saw an Aeroflot jet on the tarmac as we landed, and it was explained to me it was filled with young kids from Chernobyl coming from Ukraine to get treatment after yeah. the, the disaster there. And I think I also read something where Cubans sent more doctors to Africa during the Ebola crisis than the United States, for that matter. You know, we are raised and we were raised, since we are little, in that sentiment, that feeling of solidarity that we have to share what we have. 
we have little, but we have to share what we have. Um, and what happened in Chernobyl was a terrible, a disaster for Ukraine. And you have so many kids and relatives with had uh, health issues because of that. And we opened our country to cure them, and we cured them. And a little bit of context to that. That was 1992. The Soviets had just pulled the economic plug on Cuba. The special period was happening. It was very difficult to find food or anything in Cuba. But Cuba was still extending this medical care yeah. to and, the Ukraine. Yeah, and what happened with Ebola, you were saying, we also sent doctors to, to uh, Africa. And with COVID, uh, and every time with Ebola and COVID on any time, we send doctors to any country, we do it upon a request of those governments. Mm -hmm. And uh, our doctors go to, the, to places where sometimes the doctors of those countries cannot go for any reason, maybe because they don't have enough doctors or for any other reason, and they go there. And we have found that uh, in some cases, those communities, when our doctors arrive, it is the first time for them to have a doctor, even to see a doctor in their life. So, and uh, some people, I mean, for, for some time, uh, it has been portrayed in the U.S. by some, uh, but uh, uh, the government or some people in Congress as uh, slavery is not slavery at all. We share. We bring health care to people and to communities that, are, that they need it. And we do it with the best resources that we have, that is human resources. And it's also been part of your foreign policy. I mean, there's soft yeah. power and there's hard power. And it seems like Cuba throughout Latin America has used this soft power, this ability with uh, uh, health care to try to bridge relationships in different parts of Latin America. Uh, the main objective is to help people. Mm -hmm. That's the main objective, to help those that are in need of health care. Mm -hmm. That is why we do it. And we will continue to do it as long as we have uh, the, the, I mean, the resources to, to do it, the doctors to, to do it. And as I said, always upon a request of those governments. Now, Ambassador, you say you're meeting with the agriculture sector. Isn't that one of the few areas where the United States and Cuba can do business, that we've been exporting food, even throughout the embargo period? Is this kind of the one place that you have ability to work some business deals now? It's the only thing that we can buy in the U.S., agriculture products. Mm -hmm. Other than that, uh, by law, because of the sanctions, you're not allowed to, to do it. Uh, and it's difficult for the rest of the product that we need. In agriculture, we can do it. And uh, for years, we have been buying food uh, uh, from some states in the US. And uh, we could span that if it weren't that we have to do it in conditions, under conditions that you cannot call it trade. Uh, conditions being you have to pay in cash. We had to pay, we had to make upfront payments in cash. We, ha we don't have access to credit, uh, which is a normal, the normal way to, to, to do trade. And when the, the vessels goes to Cuba, they cannot bring our exp experts to the US. Mm -hmm. So. Ambassador, someone had a very clever title for tonight. It's embargo and engagement. But let's set the record straight. You rarely use the term embargo. You have a different word for it. Blockade. Blockade. <laughs> let's talk about the difference there. The blockade is, it brings back memories. In fact, a lot of people, when I told them I was doing this tonight, they said, oh, yes, yes, the embargo or the blockade started after the Cuban Missile Crisis. But really, it started well before the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it's not really as a result of that diplomatic collapse, but... There have been embargoes or blockades between the United States and Cuba well before the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, before 1959, 
we used to buy everything here, everything. And uh, the experts was only sugar, we could say, mainly, mainly sugar. And when the revolution came to power right away, uh, the relations were finished. We broke up and uh, the sugar quota that we used to have to uh, sell product, I mean, to, to have kind of income to Cuba was finished as well. And uh, after that, we had to find other ways to develop our economy, not with the, with the U.S. We wish we could do it with the U.S. You are our neighbor. 90 miles away. We are close. Yeah, and we cannot move. Mm-hmm. You cannot move. <laughs> we won't move. So uh, we had to, and that maybe will uh, bring to uh, bring us to any other question from you or from the audience. Okay. We had to find ways to live. Well, about 187 other countries well, who vote the UN every year say yeah. the same thing. And surprisingly, there's only one other country that joins with us in vetoing that resolution to end the embargo, and that is Israel. Are you surprised that with this demonstration of all these other countries, they can't shift the balance here to? Well, uh, it's not me who has to answer that. (laughs) You're a diplomat. Yeah, but I cannot answer by them. Uh. Yeah. But uh, but let's talk about, well, I'll talk about our politics. So President Biden was talking about this being a failed policy and that he was going to try to uh, eliminate some of these inhumane restrictions. Um, Has there been any movement in that direction from what you heard before he was elected? Uh, Well, he said so uh, during his campaign. Then uh, some measures were announced in May, on May 2022, uh, the U.S. government reestablished remittances to Cuba, and they reopened flights to uh, some international airports in, in Cuba, mm-hmm. because with Trump, Havana was only the one that was left mm-hmm. to, to, for travels, uh, for f- air flights from the U.S., and uh, Biden established people-to-people travel in groups, not by individual, like the one we have with Obama. Uh, that mainly talking about sanctions. The rest is the same. We are still, Cuba is still included in the list of state sponsored terrorism, which is extremely unfair. We are not a, ter- we are not a terrorist country. Cuba is a country of peace, a country of solidarity, a country of friendship. We, 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 we don't have to be in that list. Mm-hmm. And because we are in that list, we uh, are enduring one of the uh, most difficult times in economically speaking, because we don't have access to credits it's difficult to find banks who want to operate with Cuba. It's difficult to uh, find companies who want to sell anything to Cuba. And when, do, when you find them, maybe we have to pay double or triple the normal cost of uh, any product because there's a risk to, uh, to trade with Cuba because of that list or because of the sanction. But now we are talking about the, the, the list. Mm-hmm. And uh, with the Biden administration, we have rest- dozen sanctions. That is the chicken of the rice, we could call it. Mm-hmm. And it and is what the sanctions are the biggest obstacle to the development of Cuba. Well, the added knock-on effect here with once they put you on the state support terror list, that meant it was a warning to all other countries not to do business with you and not to travel to Cuba if they wanted to travel to the United States or do business with the United States. I will go on that. I will go on that as well. Because we are in the list of state sponsored terrorism, tourism is one of our main income. If you are French or any 
any European citizen. And before January 11, 2020, January 12, 2021, if you travel to Cuba, no problem. But after we were re-included in the list of state-sponsored terrorism in January 12, 2021, if you travel to Cuba, if you travel to the U.S. and you travel to Cuba after that day, you cannot enjoy this ES, ESTA program, visa program to enter, to come to the U.S. You have to ask for an appointment if one of your embassies in, in Europe waits for that, could be immediately, but it could take weeks, days, or months. Mm -hmm. And if you're planning vacations, vacation, you say, no, I don't go into that process. I better go straight. Uh, uh, let, let me finish. And then uh, that's talking on sanctions. If, you, if we talk, you, you were asking about what happened with the Biden administration. We have, uh, by the Biden administration has reestablished some dialogues that we had with the Obama administration and even some with Trump administration, like the like on migration, uh, law enforcement, because we are neighbors. We have we we have to talk about drug trafficking, human trafficking, trafficking in person, uh, migration fraud, and all that. We have to talk about environment, healthcare, and we are talking on that, but. Those dialogues that are important and necessary as neighbors don't have a direct impact of the life of the Cuban people. How did you feel personally having negotiated during the Obama administration, <laughs> opening up when I was in Cuba in January, everyone talked about before Obama, after Obama, Trump, Biden. So it's a very demarcation line in how life has been on the island since Obama opened it up, then it got closed down, and we're talking about 2021. That was the last week of the Trump administration when it was closed down. How did you feel personally after having gone so far in 2015? You know, uh, when you, it's, it's like this, it's always better to work in a positive way. I'm a positive person trying to achieve something positive for our people trying to find uh, useful ways to, to engage, to cooperate, than being uh, working on sanctions or how to overcome the situation because there is a sanction. When we had these two years from 2015 to 2017 with the Obama administration, uh, we have dialogues to uh, overcome that kind of situation. Obama is sanctions, not as not as much as uh, he could probably, and, and most as much as was needed. But he, he is uh, some, and you have back then, and that's why you heard that in in Cuba, because there was a sense in our population that the situation, the economic situation was better, and it was really better. Yeah, people said, I bought a house. I bought my first house, and, and, and my business was going good, and I was expanding this, and there was all this optimism. And yeah. then now, it's a total reversal, and probably, in, if there's any context, so it seems like they feel even worse than they were before 2015. Yeah, you have, for example, back then, you had the cruise ship going to Cuba. You have families that make their living out of that. Mm -hmm. The drivers of the old cars in Havana that many of you, <laughs> if I travel to Cuba, enjoyed, or the restaurants of the tourist guides, they were, or, or, the, or the, the families that just plan the food mm -hmm. for the restaurants. Mm -hmm. So, when the cruise, the cruise ship were cut off, they were out of job, out of work. So Ambassador, using all the power of the Commonwealth Club tonight, <laughs> and your good charm and good humor, we wave these flowers and we say the embargo is over tomorrow. Yeah, hope so. What happens? What, 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 what would we see in Cuba? I mean, because all 
economic problems seem to be blamed on the embargo. Makes logical sense, but I'm not sure all of them are due to the embargo. But how fast do you think the Cuban economy would change if the embargo was lifted? Well, that's a unique situation that we haven't lived before. But we always say, because some people blame only to the Cuban government for the economic hardships that we are enduring. And some people in Cuba, we said, give us two years. Three years. Three years or two years without the sanctions. And yes, because some people say the Cuban government used the embargo as cover for its economic failures. But you what what happened from 2015 to 2017? The situation was better. Yeah. And the numbers of people that you had coming to the U.S. as migrants was less, less and less than the one that you have now. So there's a direct link between migration and sanctions. But even with the embargo, uh, Cuba has been supported extensively by the Soviet Union in the 90s. I think it was $5 billion a year. Then after they dropped out, Venezuelan came in, supplying you with oil that you could use for yourself and that you could sell to elsewhere. What happens if things don't change the embargo? Does this, is this any indication you think that maybe this great socialist economy experiment, the longest in Latin America, have, may have run its course? Or do you think you have the, the, the mechanisms to grow the economy? Well, Mike, we have plans to overcome uh, the present situation, and uh, we will do it. We will do it. We have a clear vision that we don't want to go back to 1959. We want to be, and it is the only thing that we want, to be an independent country with self-determination, with no one interfering in our internal affairs. We, have a, we want a Cuba with, for everyone, and for every Cuban with a prosper, I mean, with, a, with prosperity, with a good future, with health care, with education, as we have. And can you do it both with your current economic system? Or like China and Deng Xiaoping in the 70s and Gorbachev in the 90s, they made some major modifications to their economic structure to advance their country and advance their people. Do you think Cuba could do the same thing? Cuba, you know, uh, we are doing the transformations the, in our economic and social model that is appropriate for Cuba according to our history according to our conditions, and especially to the conditions that we have due to the sanctions that are totally different to any other country in the world. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing is according to our necessity and especially to our conditions. Mm -hmm. we, are, uh, we are having the biggest on one of the, I mean, process of uh, opening in terms of the uh, economic, uh, economically speaking. For example, we passed a new uh, uh, constitution in 2019 for more than 80% of approval of our population. And in that, after you, had, uh, you have a new constitution, you need to have new laws in the country to adapt the whole legislative uh, system to that new uh, constitution. And after that, and uh, coming from the 6th, uh, the 7th, and the 8th Congress of our uh, Communist Party, that in, in which we establish the need for uh, our economic and social model to, to make some changes 
in the opening of the private sector, the self-employment, and then the private and the cooperative sector. We, are, we have been working on that. But do you think you might be running out of time? A situation, we always talk, there are cycles and the Cuban economy it takes some big hits, and it's taking a big hit right now. Uh, fuel prices are up 300%, there's more rationing, food prices are up, you just fired your finance minister. Um, is this a crisis, or is this just business as usual in Cuba? Well, we are having, as I said, one of the most difficult economic uh, times in Cuba. After the pandemic, uh, most, I mean, the whole, co the whole world was uh, hit by the pandemic. But Latin America recovered faster, other countries recovered faster? Yeah, but none of them has a country like the U.S., Mm -hmm. with their boot, its boot in our neck, trying to strangle mm -hmm. us. Did you find so, that particularly vindictive from the United States because even during the height of COVID, we cut off medical supplies, everything else, that was, that were put under the embargo? You know, during COVID, I came in January 2021, and the U.S. did something good for those countries that were uh, under sanction system, they were, they make like a waiver for them to have access to medical supplies and all that. You know, the only country that was not included in that waiver? Cuba. Cuba. Mm -hmm. We didn't have access to oxygen. At some point, our oxygen plan was out of order, was not functioning. And we had people in Cuba that desperately needed oxygen. And we have companies here who apply for that and never get the license. So it's difficult to work in those conditions, you know? So a country that was once the pride of Latin America for healthcare, again, relating when my wife and I went back in January, we brought a suitcase full of medical supplies because the people we we're gonna be talking with saying, we've postponed surgeries and whatever because we don't have the medical supplies. And we know Cuba has the medical expertise. So now it's a matter of having the things they need to do. You need, for that you need what? Trade. Money. Money and trade. Money and trade. Our main income, one of our main income is tourism. And we were talking about that before. Europe is one of our main uh, uh, incoming uh, visitors. And now we have, because of the US, including Cuba, having included Cuba in the list of state sponsors of terrorism, we have less European going to Cuba. Because let me just explain, if a European goes to Cuba and then they want to come to the United States, not on the same trip, but just same year, now they have to get a visa to come to the United States. So, in Asia and everywhere else. So people are taking Cuba off their list because they think they're gonna to go to the United States at some point and they don't want that extra hassle. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, the So you need money to buy the medicines. Mm -hmm. We used to produce, and we have the, 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 the capacity to produce more than 60% of the medicines that we need in Cuba. We used to do that. But you need money to buy medicines or the raw materials to do it. Mm -hmm. How are you going to do it with that uh, amount of sanctions and kind of sanctions or being labeled as a terrorist country? It's difficult. I, I'm always asking myself, could the U.S. economy, let's say, let's, let's say we are the, the, the superpower and you are the small island. Could the U.S. economy develop in those conditions? There's no way that you could do it. It's difficult to, to advance. We have the will to do it. There's a decision, a governmental decision to have a better country, to have a better life for our, for our people with due, all due respect for environment, for, the, for education, for health care, but it's difficult to advance in those conditions. Where does the conflict come with your ideological goals that you want to maintain since the revolution and the economic realities? Does there have to be some give and take on both sides? I don't see any contradiction. 
you know. Well, I, I noticed that even during the height of COVID, GDP lost what thirty percent of your GDP, and you were still doing all your social programs. You didn't limit that. But my question really is this: Is it at a certain point do you have to look at what your goals are as a country, as a people, and what is needed to make sure that they have a quality of life? Well, we are doing. What we are doing now, do we need to develop, to give more autonomy to the public companies? We are doing it. Do we need to have more uh, cooperative? We'll do it. We, we are doing it. Do we need to have more private companies? We are doing it. Do we need to engage all of them in the productive process? We want to do it. And our government is asking public companies all the time to engage with the cooperative and the private sector. Can you make the shift fast enough, though, for companies working in an open market or a market-based economy? They have to be very nimble. They have to move very quickly. Do you think with the government controls that have been placed on the economy for so many years and the restrictions and government interference that entrepreneurs and this new market-based economy can emerge. They can do it. It takes time to change people's minds, mm -hmm. but it's also, it could be easier, for example, if, le, don't, le, let's don't talk about the public companies, but now, for example, a private company, a private company in Cuba, they cannot have a bank account in the U.S. to buy products. Talking about the private companies. That's quite, quite a limitation. Yeah. They cannot trade freely and openly uh, with the U.S. in normal terms, like, as I said, with the bank account and all that. They cannot export freely uh, their products to, to the U.S. So any product that they produce. Cuba cannot buy anything that has more than 10% of U.S. component. Not even this glass. If we want to, let, some people say, why you don't have planes? How are we going to have planes? Find any, well, probably they ha there is one, I don't know, I'm not a specialist in that. But find a plane that has less than 10%, the whole thing, less than 10% of U.S. components. Let's go to IT. During the Obama administration, the, there was a, this uh, always request by the U.S., open internet in Cuba, open internet in Cuba. We have a plan to, de uh, to uh, develop not only internet, but IT in Cuba. It is it's a governmental plan. It's a main objective in Cuba. And we did it by ourselves. But it is challenging, and it was challenging, and it is still challenging. Try to find 100%, I don't know, a server. That is 100% without a 10% of US component. It's difficult. You can find it, but it's difficult. And we have to operate that in that condition. And when you find it, they won't sell it to the same price that they will sell it to a, a U.S. company. You say, Cuba, no, there's a risk. Why, not, know, why not China? There's a risk. There's a, I mean, we have done with China, but we could be buying that in the U.S., why not? Huawei has just been great for exporting its technology to countries all through Eastern Europe and everywhere else. So I'm not just saying, you know, it's bad the United States won't do this, but aren't there other sources that you can get it that are not fearful of the United States retaliation? It's difficult. It's difficult. I don't have the figure yet, but I've been told that this, in 2023, there was a record, a record figure, a record amount of fines against uh, foreign companies that had done business with foreign companies and U.S. companies that had been, have been engaged in any kind of business with Cuba. So if you are a bank or a company, a company you think twice. 
You know, I think both people on all sides of the argument will say this is pretty much a failed foreign policy. The embargo was intended to have you change your ideology. That hasn't happened over 60 years, and there's probably no indication it will. Okay, so if we say it's a failed foreign policy, is this an American problem or is this a Cuban-American problem? Where is all the pressure you see on preventing us from doing the right thing here or, or opening up a new thought process on this all? You know, uh, there is a whole, we call it hatred industry against Cuba and a big misinformation operation against Cuba. If you have, if you are an American that have never traveled to Cuba or have not had any relation with, uh, with someone that has traveled to Cuba, prob- prob- you have high chances that your image or the, the vision that you have on Cuba was not the, about the right, the right Cuba. U.S. Congress pass, has been passing for decades, 20 millions every year for regime change program against Cuba. And that goes to radio stations or newspapers that are all time, every time, every day, distorting the reality of Cuba. It's difficult to, to, to uh, advance with that. And uh, Cuba is always ready and has conveyed to the U.S. government our will to have better relations, even with the Trump administration. Does it feel with like- respect. The only thing that we ask is respect. Mm-hmm. And with that on the table, which is a basic rule for any relation, any human being relation, we can advance. You were talking about, it, it is a failed policy. It is a failed policy because it doesn't serve to the U.S., to the interests of the U.S. people that should be and could be enjoying of good uh, relation uh, with, uh, with Cuba. It serves to that hatred industry that is living out of that uh, money. Uh, but otherwise, I, I don't find any explanation. Do you feel it any different when you come out to the West, California or whatever? You talk about that $20 million disinformation regime change. Probably is pretty strong in South Florida, uh, given the population down there. But when you get into the hinterland of the United States, or you get out to the West Coast, do you still feel that visceral opposition to normalizing relations? When you travel across the U.S., what you find is people eager to have information about Cuba. When you explain, the US, US people is a good people. You're honest, you're open to have information, and when you have information, the question is, but why are we in this situation? Why don't we have better relation with our neighbors? And it's not that, uh, I mean, we, can, we, we, we have disagreements. Like in families, you have disagreements, but you sit and talk and find common ground to advance, and we can do it with the U.S. Is the obstacle, do you think, the Cuban-American community in the Southeast, or is it their representatives in the Senate and Congress? I don't think it's the Cuban-American community. If you go back to the Obama administration, to the polls back then, more than half of the of the uh, Cuban American community favor uh, was against the, the the blockade against the sanctions and was uh, I mean favoring better relations because they have families there. Oh, we're flying in the plane lands in Havana, people cheer. Yeah, I mean, they're excited. They were so happy to be so, back. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, we're going back into this enemy world of ours. This is their country. This is their culture, and they were so happy to be back with their families again. So I think that it is a policy that serves to some uh, people in Congress. I don't know, probably to the person that are financing them, but it, I'm sure it doesn't serve to the interests of the U.S. people. 
So who's going to make the first move? What, do, what would be a great sign for the United States that they're really serious? Forget, let's say, who comes in the next administration. What would be a leading indicator that, hey, things are really changing here now? We had to sit and talk. Would it be straight up on the embargo decision? Uh, you know, loosening the trade restrictions? You know, uh, the, any current president of the U.S., with a stroke of a pen, can go back to January 2017. Because during the, the Trump administration, more than 200, 243 measures, executive measures, mm -hmm. were taken by the president to strengthen the, the sanctions. So and if we went back to that, yeah. what would be the reaction of Cuba? What would Cuba put on the table to keep that momentum going? Well, we had to sit and talk to see where we are, to see where we are. What, what are your priorities as U.S. government? Americans and are what are our priorities? Americans are concerned about security, and you are developing relationships with Iran, China, and, and, and others. We are not a threat for the U.S. We have never been a threat for the U.S. No, you are uh, not, but uh, nor you were never were until the Soviets put missiles on the island, too. So what I'm saying is, if the Americans are very concerned, right or wrong, that because you were negotiating with China, Iran, and, and, and Russia. You know, we, we could, I mean, we could sleep here. We were going to the <laughs> missile crisis. Uh, but at, back then, we wanted to make it public, you know. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to discuss that. No, I remember hearing yeah, that. Yeah. Really, really. No, 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 no. That's history. And, you know, we would never, we have never done, and we would never do anything against the U.S. or against any other country's security. Mm -hmm. We will never put in danger any, others, any other people's country. Mm -hmm. Never. We have relation with any country in this world mm -hmm. that come to us with respect mm -hmm. because we need that. Mm -hmm. They say the key to any great negotiations is know what the other side wants and needs most. And if you could sit, if you and I were going to make the decision now, yeah. and I'm sizing up you what you want, and you're sizing me up what, uh, what I want, what do you think Cuba could do to really give an indication that it's not going to be business as usual? We want to go with the momentum of getting back to the 2015 uh, accords we had with Obama during the Obama administration. So let's move this thing along. We know it bothers you guys. Here's what we're going to do. We don't do things like that. <laughs> okay. You know, this is very serious. Yeah. I mean, we are talking about relations. We are talking about the destiny of peoples. Mm -hmm. So we, and yeah, we take not that. Horse, I hate to simplify as horse. Yeah, yeah. No, and, no, no. And I know, I know. But we take that very seriously. And it has to be a comprehensive dialogue mm -hmm. about many things. Mm -hmm. And we are ready for that. And do you think because of what you were able to accomplish in 2015, that comprehensive dialogue won't be as difficult the next time around? Because you've already been there, done that, and everyone knows it kind of works? History show, shows that we can do it. We sit as civilized human beings mm -hmm. for the first time in equal conditions in terms of respect. We can do it. Why not? Let's Why not? For the good of the Cuban people and the U.S. people. Why not? Let's do it tonight. Let's do it. <laughs> Some questions from our audience. Uh, I read that Cuba wants donations of milk powder. Why is Cuba short of milk? What other food shortages does Cuba face? Well, uh, you know, we have a relation, long relation with many organizations at the UN. In the past, Cuba has donated uh, sugar and other products to, to, to the UN, uh, different UN organization. And uh, we, w we have been talking for almost one hour about uh, sanctions and the conditions in our economy. And now we have a, a shortage of milk. You know, in Cuba, and why we have a, a, a shortage of milk? 
In Cuba, we guarantee milk for every children under seven, regardless of their father's salary, regardless of their father's position, for every child in the country under seven. How many countries do that? It'd be hard pressed in this country to do that. So, we treat every child under seven the same. They need milk and we have to guarantee that. And we have been doing that for decades. Now we have this difficult situation and we, we were offered help and we accepted by the UN on that. Follow up on that question, other food shortages. I know rationing has become more difficult there. Food prices have been raised yeah. uh, for these shortages. We have, you know, I mean, shortage of scarcity, so many things. Food is one of them. Mm -hmm. And do you think with the private sector, or do you think that the, is there any way to reinvigorate your agricultural system to be more sustainable like you were before? We are confident that with these uh, plans that we have to develop our economy, uh, we will overcome the situation. It will take time, I tell you, because as I said, you have to walk with your, ha with your hands and, and feet tight with the sanctions not access to credit and all that. But we will do it, and we are confident that we can achieve it. I can't remember the exact number, but when I read it, I was really shocked by saying that uh, government control of land has shrank to about only 12%. The rest now is in private Mo hands. Most of the food production is in private or cooperative hands. And hopefully that might change the dynamic? Of course. Uh, what is Cuba doing to develop renewable energy to reduce Cuba's dependence on countries like Russia or Venezuela for oil? Uh, can, for Cuba, can, can Cuba solve this problem by being less energy dependent? You know, uh, that's a priority for Cuba. That's a priority. And uh, in our economic plans for, we have, we need to, we have, and we are working to have by uh, 2030 uh, around 24% of our uh, energy coming for renewable energy. We have a lot of sun in Cuba. So solar energy could be easier, but we need to fight, we need to buy the solar panels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we come to the first question. So. Talk about the supply side. How much oil are you getting from Venezuela now? Do you have? I don't, I don't have that fee. I mean, not in, not in yeah. barrels or whatever, but uh, you used to get oil from Venezuela you could use for yourself and you could sell on the open market. We can have it from the US if you, are, if you want to sell us. Yeah. We're ready for that. The United States was just declared the largest producer of oil. Yeah. Past Why market. not from the US? Okay. We are ready for that. We're close. We're yeah. close. We're close. Right? Yeah. Uh, question. Will you visit Napa to see our grape and wine production while you're here? I love it. <laughs> I love it. But I don't, I, I don't think I have time. I love it. Yeah. I have heard that it's a beautiful area. Uh, I have tried your wines. Okay. And they're good. It's good. <laughs> yeah. It's good. Uh, probably the most important question of the evening. In your opinion, how can Americans best have their voices heard to end the economic sanctions against Cuba? When you travel to Cuba, just say what you, what you heard there and what you see there. Don't believe me. Go. And people are invited to go in December? A trip? Yeah, go and see you with your own eyes. Talk to the Cuban people and come back and replicate or think about it and say what you saw there. You say there's this huge disinformation campaign against Cuba and this initiative to do a regime change. What can people around the country of the United States do 
to communicate to their elected officials that it's time for a new chapter in our histories. It's up to you to do it. I cannot come and tell you to do it. Uh, but um, what I can tell you is that we are, again, a country of peace, a welcoming country, a country of people that when you come will open their houses to welcome you with, and will share with you what we have. That is little, but we do it from our heart. We tra- with friendship. And this is what we want to share with the U.S. people. Yep. Only that. Ambassador, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. So as we're talking about, you have the invitation from the ambassador. Now you have an <laughs> invitation from the next most important guy, Philip Yoon. He's going to take you to Cuba in December if you'd like to go. Uh, go. The Commonwealth Club is, is, is putting together a trip, and there's some brochures around. And um, you, you're really right. You, people have to see it and feel it to, to kind of dispel all the things that they've heard. Uh, people have a good sense of fairness in people. Yeah. Let them judge. Um, there's a little reception afterwards for some of the people who have the tickets for the post-program reception. Uh, join us in the lounge outside. And again, Ambassador, thank you. A pleasure. Thank you, Mike. All the best.